We'll just wait for one more second for uh, our last panelist. Great. Renovated headquarters. I'm Jerry Weierstein, Senior Vice President of the Institute. Uh, we're pleased uh, today to have this opportunity to host, in cooperation with Pro Just Washington, or more broadly internationally, that it deserves. Indeed, the history of half hearted or fumbling efforts to address what has been described by the State Department as the worst machinery of cruel death since the Nazis is simultaneously heartbreaking and infuriating. In its newly launched book, Blacklist Violations Committed by the Most Prominent Syrian Regime Figures and How to Bring Them to Justice, ProJustice has set out once again to offer a practical guide to address that awful international failure. As Josh Rogan writes in this morning's Washington Post, there is still hope uh, that the American people and their representatives will do something to help suffering Syrians. Before handing over to the panel, uh, let me say a word about the format for today's discussion. MEI uses Mentimeter to facilitate audience participation in our events. You'll find on your handouts the web address for Mentimeter, www.menti.com. If you go to that site on your phones and use the event code 982407, you will be able to post your questions throughout the event. Uh, the moderator will be monitoring the questions throughout the program and can use those to facilitate the conversation. You'll also be able to see the questions that other audience members are posting. And if you agree with their questions, you can like them which will signal to the moderator that this is a question of general interest to the audience. We encourage you all to take advantage of this facility. Finally, before handing over to our moderator, Joyce Caterham, let me ask you to silence your phones. We are live streaming the event, uh, but we encourage you to tweet on today's event using the hashtag MEI Syria. Uh, now let me ask Joyce Caterham uh, to, uh, to uh, take over. Uh, Joyce is an old friend of MEI, and I suspect many people here in the audience, the Washington correspondent for the Abu Dhabi-based English language daily, The National. Uh, Joyce, uh, please uh, go ahead and introduce the other members of the panel. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you all uh, for being here uh, to discuss what's um, not a light topic. I've uh, started streaming uh, the report on uh, my way back. Uh, from New York uh, last night, um, the blacklist. Uh, it's the first most comprehensive reference on uh, personas, on figures in the Syrian regime that committed atrocities, war crimes, torture, um, and it's it's pretty heavy on, on details. I, I've got to see words that I didn't didn't know existed. In the English language, for example, cropping—that's cutting someone's ears, uh, denailing. Um, I was told I have a microphone. Uh, so, um, okay, better. Well, apologies. Uh, so as I mentioned, this is uh, the first comprehensive reference to war crimes and uh, atrocities that, that includes figures in the Syrian regime that, that uh, have committed or still uh, committing uh, these, these crimes. Uh, 
and uh, it's it's really good to be here uh, among uh, friends in the new building and MEI's new, new building and with experts who followed uh, Syria day in day out since the war started uh, uh, eight years ago. Uh, so how we're gonna do this, we're gonna do a quick opening uh, remarks, then I'm gonna go around uh, our speakers after I introduce them. Uh, and as you see here, we have the www.menti.com, not to be confused with the Turkish dish, um, menti. Um, so you just go to that website and then you enter the code and it's, it's gonna be a very engaging uh, process. Any question you have at any time, we're not gonna wait till you know, people finish or, or, or till we finish our debate to, to refer to you. So just uh, send it to us and the minute I see it here, uh, you can also like a question or vote down a question. We're gonna be uh, going to you. Uh, but as I mentioned, it's it's good to be here with uh, Anne Bernard, who is with the New York Times and now covering uh, climate and uh, environment for the Metro Desk. But if you have read anything about Syria in the uh, last uh, eight years, you've probably come across Anne's uh, work. Uh, she was the bureau chief in, in Beirut prior to that and uh, had her eye all over the... Uh, Middle East. Uh, one of her writings earlier this year was Inside Syria Secret Torture Prisons. Uh, she will touch upon that, but I do urge you also to, to look it up as, uh, as, as a piece, as an excellent piece documenting uh, these atrocities. Uh, to my right is uh, a friend and uh, a colleague, Wa'al Sawah. Uh, he's the president and director of Pro Justice a Syrian-owned uh, nonprofit uh, organization. It's focused on accountability and uh, preventing uh, impunity in, in Syria. He's the editor-in-chief of the Syrian Observer, and Wael has authored a number of research papers and books on Syrian civil uh, society. Most importantly, I would say uh, Wael is a Syrian voice from Homs. Uh, who experienced firsthand life in uh, detention centers under uh, the Assad regime. He spent 10 years in Syrian prisons uh, between Tadmor, Sadnaya, and the investigative units. So it's, it's good to have you. And uh, to my left is uh, also a, a friend and an expert I, I do quote often, Charles Lister. Uh, he's a senior fellow at MEI and a director of Countering Terrorism and Extremism program here. Uh, his work focuses primarily on the conflict in Syria, and uh, uh, he is also a member of uh, the MEI convened Syria study group. Uh, prior to that, Lister uh, was a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution in Doha and a senior consultant to multinationally backed Syria Track 2 dialogue initiative. Uh, he follows uh, Syria like a hawk. Uh, don't read any political uh, indications in that, but on, on, on Twitter, uh, he's one of the few who didn't tire of covering this conflict and, and, and keeping uh, his eye on it. So. Uh, we're now gonna go to uh, opening remarks. Charles, we're gonna start with you, and then maybe we'll go to to Anne, then then Wael. Great, thank you so much, uh, Joyce, for the very kind introduction, and it's a real honor and a pleasure to be uh, on the stage alongside Anne, you, Joyce, and 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 Wael. And thank you, everybody, for for turning up. It's really heartening to see a full house uh, for a Syria event at a time when Syria as an issue is is declining rapidly, I think, in public interest. So thank you very much for, for being here to talk about a, an extremely important aspect of the Syrian crisis. Um, I thought I'd take four or five minutes just to give us a kind of 40,000 foot view of what's happened over the last eight to nine years um, in the context of, of war crimes, um, which I think uh, will then open up the ground for both Anne and Weil to give a more grounded view of to, in terms of looking more deeply at issues of accountability, which are issues both of them have a great deal more experience in than I do. 
Um, but as is no secret, we are in the ninth year of the Syrian crisis. It's nearly a decade on. Um, and at a time when this congressionally convened Syria study group just released its report this week, the big question on people's minds is, why does Syria matter or does Syria matter? Um, and quite frankly, looking back over the last nine years, you're given a whole plethora of reasons why it does matter to the United States and to the rest of the world. And just to list four obvious ones, it has been the greatest humanitarian tragedy and catastrophe in modern history. It's produced the largest flow of refugees in <coughs> modern history, destabilizing, in my opinion, parts of, the, of Europe and fueling international populism. It has provided the grounds in which we have seen the explosion of the world's most powerful terrorist organization ever, the world's most wealthy um, terrorist organization in history. And it's seen the destruction of established global norms, including the norm against the use of chemical weapons, which, by the way, have been used over 350 times in the last nine years with virtual impunity. It's become increasingly common when talking about Syria to hear that half a million people have been killed, but that number has become so established that it's almost become a number, but nothing of any real reason. But just think about 500,000 people have been killed in Syria over the last nine years. That's 170 people killed every single day for eight years straight, or all of us in this room killed every single day for 13 and a half years straight, every single day, 365 days a year. So the scale, of the, comp the scale of the crisis, the scale of the impact, the scale of the crimes are <coughs> almost unprecedented in, as I say, in modern history. And towards the subject of this discussion, which is looking specifically at the regime's complicity in these crimes, since the spring of 2011, over 14,000 people have been killed by torture. Nearly 100,000 have been forcibly disappeared and their fate still unknown. Nearly 150,000 people have arbit been arbitrarily arrested, with some estimates suggesting that number might be as high as 800,000 arbitrary arrests. And the regime specifically may not be the only criminal actor, it certainly isn't the only criminal actor in Syria, but it encompasses the vast majority of these crimes. 89% of civilians killed in Syria were killed by the regime. 99% of torture deaths were the regime's responsibility. 89% of arbitrary arrests were the responsibility of the regime, and 85% of enforced disappearances were the responsibility of the regime. The United Nations has, I think, repeatedly called the crisis in Syria an extermination campaign for a reason. The Assad regime has called its strategy one of cleansing for a reason. Um, and Sednaya prison, which very unfortunately Weil is familiar with, has had a crematorium constructed in its boundaries for a reason. And these are all issues that we shouldn't be forgetting, even though we're nine years into the Syrian conflict. And to place that into broader context, ISIS over the last five years, and as someone who, who has traditionally focused much more on countering terrorism and countering extremism, ISIS has become an almost obsession for the international community when we're looking at Syria. But ISIS is responsible for only 2% of civilian casualties over the last nine years. Only 0.2% of all deaths by torture. So they are a truly evil terrorist organization, but when you compare it to the crimes of the regime, it is incomparable. So at this point in, uh, in, in this very depressing conversation, I do want to, as Joy said, reiterate that if you haven't read Anne's piece, um, on, on the, uh, the prison system in Syria, I strongly recommend you do. This week, as it happens, um, NPR, National Public Radio, have also had a four-part series on war crimes and accountability in Syria by Deborah Amos, which I'd also encourage you to go out and listen to and read. Um, but it's worth just pointing at this time, before I use up too much time, that beyond the simple human desire to see accountability realized in Syria and justice realized, We've got, to, we've got to also accept the fact that conflict in one way or another isn't necessarily going to end in Syria anytime soon, particularly given the fatigue of the international community. But in eight years of working on Syria, I simply have totally lost count of the number of people who have either lost people to the prison system and to other crimes in Syria, but also who have themselves experienced that prison system. Um, and, and, you know, one individual always comes to my mind. Um, I won't share his identity, but he's, he's no longer with us. He was an older gentleman. 
Every single one of his fingers was bent crooked in multiple directions. Uh, he had basically a small hole in his head from where he had been made to sit with a drip of water dripping on his forehead for over a year. That drip of water for over a year had pummeled a hole into his head. Um, and these individuals are still living today. Hundreds, if not thousands of them, are still alive. Um, and with the war going on and unending, but with a discussion about post-conflict reconciliation, constitutional committees, peace processes, the justice and the accountability for these individuals is going to have to be an issue that is tackled unless we are simply to see Syria riven by conflict forever. Um, so this is a truly in, um, important issue, not just on a political level, but on the individual psyches of every single person who has been personally hit by this, by this issue. And the crimes are far from over. We heard the US government say yesterday chemical weapons were used earlier this year. It's still going on. Detentions increased last year and this year as compared to previous years. So uh, I have lots of other things I, I would love to say, but we'll have time in, in the question and answers. But, but frankly speaking, international commitment to Syria is declining at a time in which it needs to increase the, the most, the more than it has ever over the last nine years. And the issue of justice and accountability is probably one of those top level issues that needs so much more attention than it's being given. So I'm, I'm glad that the Middle East Institute is here to, to talk about this issue. Thank you, Charles, for that broad view. I think, yes, I can take it from here to talk in a little more detail about what I and my colleagues investigated in Syria and why. To summarize, we put together, I think, what was the most comprehensive account in the major media about what was going on in the Syrian prison system, which had existed for decades in Syria and was in many ways the basis for maintaining order uh, and dominance by the Assad family government over four decades. What we did is talk about the full context of how this system expanded once the Syrian revolt began and as it turned into a war and how, it, how this system helped it turn into a war. We talked about how the system operated as a tool, a very effective tool for the Syrian government to first militarize the conflict and then um, win it, uh, at least the first phase of it, through maximum repression, through violence of any kind of civilian dissent. We also tried to take documentation and um, evidence of this uh, system to a stronger level of documentation. So uh, whereas it's not as if we discovered anything new, every Syrian knows about this system. And uh, as Charles said, uh, if you spend any time with Syrians, you come to be amazed by how, what a high percentage of them from all walks of life, even from people who are not particularly political, how many people know someone who had been through that system even before the conflict began, and then since the conflict began, that number rose exponentially. But what we did do is, after spending many years uh, in the course of covering the conflict, interviewing dozens of people about their experiences inside the system and about uh, relatives who had disappeared into the system, we found people among that group who were willing to speak fully on the record with their photographs, with their names, with all the details. And every account that we highlighted in our piece was corroborated by multiple other accounts uh, that described similar methods of torture, similar systems, similar circumstances in the, in the same facilities in which those people were tortured. We also uh, brought in the context of the uh, many tons of documents that have been smuggled out of Syria and compiled by Syrian organizations and by the uh, Committee for International Justice and Accountability, uh, to the, which highlight the internal documents and orders of 
the government to increase arrests and specifically to go after journalists, organizers of demonstrations, and to prioritize really going after civilians and raising the cost of peaceful protest in Syria. We've also managed to match uh, one of the accounts of, of one of our main uh, people whose, whose accounts we highlighted, two specific documents that mentioned her name, corroborated the time and place of her uh, detention, and uh, we were able to determine that the person she identified as her main torturer who uh, raped her nightly uh, as a person who was separately identified in those documents as the head of investigations in the branch where she was held. I don't know if he's featured in your book, but but we'll find out. Um, so so we, we've tried to really address the fact that this is a crime that goes on behind closed doors. And so uh, at, at, on one level, it's impossible to verify any one person's account. But when you take it in the aggregate and you bring together all this corroboration, I think we and many other journalists, Syrian organizations, UN committees have, have really found a massive amount of uh, evidence of what's going on with this system. And of course, I also spent many, many years trying to document other types of war crimes and violence against civilians in the context of bombardments and chemical weapons and barrel bombs and all the other forms of indiscriminate warfare. Uh, in some ways, this seized the world's attention more because it was happening in front of our eyes because of the many Syrians who risked their lives to videotape what was going on and share it with the world. On some level, uh, there will always be uh, a debate and an excuse, uh, especially when we see the state of Raqqa and Mosul after the US uh, uh, campaigns to, to rid those cities of ISIS. There will always be a debate about how, how can you fight a, a, a terrorist group that's operating in an urban environment without causing quote unquote civilian casualties. Uh, but the thing, the area where there is really no dispute about international law and um, local law being violated is in these torture prisons where people are being kept in conditions that the UN referred to as uh, extermination because the conditions are so deadly that anyone who stays there for a long time is very likely to die simply from disease and malnutrition. The forms of sadistic torture that really sort of had an unlimited inventiveness to them. Um, and uh, we're all used in the name of, of saying that the entire opposition is terrorist. So once, once the people were, once it became clear that you would end up in these torture dungeons if you tried to protest the regime, uh, it, it turned out that it was very difficult for civil society activists to persuade people not to take up arms. And this is, and in, in fact, prisoners were weaponized by the Syrian government, releasing known jihadists who they had sent previously to fight in Iraq, releasing them uh, at a time when they were vacuuming up the people who sought a middle way between extremists and, and the Assad government. So at the end of the day, as Charles mentioned, None of this is to excuse war crimes by any other group in the conflict, especially ISIS, where although the focus has been on uh, internationals who were uh, very gruesomely and publicly killed by ISIS, really Syrians uh, bore the brunt of that as well with some 800,000 kidnapped by ISIS. But when we're talking about the Syrian government, we're talking about a UN member state, a country, that has used the full mechanisms available to it of state power to, on a massive scale, sweep up its opponents into these unthinkable dungeons. And this has normalized this use of maximum violence against civilians with impunity. And I think that, of course, we can look at the antecedents. This isn't something new in the world. But, and, and the US has done its part to set the table for an environment with the US response to 9-11 and uh, its invasion of Iraq for, for melting away international norms. The US even used rendition to send uh, suspects to 
the Assad prisons for torture. So no, no one's hands are clean here. But I think the, the massive use of this method that was able to uh, yield at least uh, a win in one phase of the war for this government um, has sh provided a roadmap to other authoritarians around the world. I think when we see what's happening to a million Uyghurs in China, it's impossible to see it as a coincidence that there's a green light to do these kinds of things. Even what's happening at the US southern border where d detention in horrendous conditions is being normalized uh, is something that, that the world really needs to look at and ask ourselves um, how to respond. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for all of you to sparing the time and uh, come to this event. Thank you to the Middle East Institute for hosting this event. I'm uh, really privileged to sit on this panel together with Anne and Charles and, uh, of course, with my good friend uh, Joyce. Um, the world is becoming tired of Syria. It's been nine years now. And the Syrians themselves are exhausted. The world is exhausted. You are exhausted. The governments are exhausted. The uh, relief agencies are exhausted. And everybody wants to brush their shoulders off uh, this tragedy uh, that makes them every day face the reality of cruelty and uh, and uh, disaster and torture and killing and the loss of lives and we don't want to see that every day so we want uh, sometimes to 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 rest to relax to forget about this but the problem is that while we are sitting discussing this event here now there are people who are being killed in my country. There are people who are being arrested now at this moment. And there are thousands of people who are now being tortured. With different kinds of, of uh, torture, uh, methods of uh, torture that you, you really don't want even to think, to think of. So we cannot, we cannot forget what's happening in Syria. We cannot forget uh, this tragedy not only because of ethics, not be only because it, it's immoral to forget, but also because of pragmatical uh, reasons. It's really, uh, as uh, yesterday and today, we, 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 we attended a very good uh, um, event with uh, the Syria, Syria study group, where... Uh, some some speakers said that it's we cannot ignore Syria because it has impact on us. So it's not only a matter of um, mo uh, morality, but also because it's it's important for us. We cannot because it has impact on us. So the people the the world now is looking for a political solution, which is good. But the problem is that if the any political solution is based on uh, rehabilitating this regime and forgetting the past and uh, stretching hands to to have shake hands and photos and then leave what 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 happened in the past behind us it will not it will not work the it's it's very important to understand that if we want a real peace that uh, is a lasting peace there has to be accountability and to that end our organization, Pro Justice, found it very important to remind the people of this very important issue. No peace without justice. If you want a lasting peace, if you want stability in Syria, if you want to see a, a civil Syria, a democratic Syria, um, uh, a stable and secure Syria, you, you have to focus on a very important issue, which is accountability. This is our major uh, goal of establishing uh, pro-justice as a non-profit organization that focus on accountability and prevention of um, impunity 
in, uh, in Syria. So the question was, what, what a value added we, 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 we make as, as an organization? And what value added our project here, black, uh, the blacklist, will, will really aid? We have, we have dozens of uh, very good, excellent organizations. We have here two distinguished uh, Syrian leaders of human rights. My good friend Fadal Abdel Ghani and my good friend Ziad, uh, uh, Radwan Ziadi. Both of them are le readers of uh, uh, human rights in Syria. And in addition to them, there are a another dozen of very good organizations that work on this domain and document uh, atrocities in Syria. So what value added we wanted to have? In principle, we wanted to put all, to, to make a reference, to make a guide for people who work in uh, justice, whether in Syria or at the international level, to go to one place and find all the kinds of atrocities that took place and to find all kinds of perpetrators that uh, committed these, uh, these crimes. So is, is this book we are launching today a legal document that can be used in court? I doubt this. But this is not what we wanted. It, we, want, we didn't want a legal document that can be used in a court, but we wanted a document that you, everybody, the lawyers, prosecutors, journalists, want to look at one important person, uh, perpetrators, or the crimes they committed. They can go to this book and, and use it as, as uh, a reference for the rest. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm going to follow up um, on this. Um, okay. uh, I'm going to follow up. You said that the, the list you have uh, in there, the, the 93 names uh, you have cited. Um, Too many the 93 names you have in in uh, in the report, uh, what kind of methodology, what kind of sourcing uh, did you did you bring together to 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 you know to make this list? This is this is you know having covered Syria for forever myself. This is the first list I see you know documented and in such way. Uh, did you use open sources? Is it uh, Syrians you've talked to? If you can tell us a little bit about. Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, we used actually open open sources and we used our private channels uh, that provided some uh, information and filled in in the gaps. But uh, we 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 uh, referred to um, a multiple multiple uh, sources of information that are available uh, to to everyone. We also contacted uh, colleagues and friends of ours to get information from their data that uh, has not been shared with others. And we have our own uh, channels, our own people on the ground in Syria who provided, who filled in the gaps and uh, helped in, in uh, making the, the, the big picture. What uh, method, methodology actually, we, um, we chose the, the worst perpetrators based on uh, chain of command. So, uh, we, we started by the people on the top of, uh, of the uh, chain of command because they are the, the, the major people who created this problem, who gave the orders, and on many times the person who gives the order is much worse than the person who triggers uh, the gun against you. So we, we, we watched that closely and we, we, um, we created a series of perpetrators from the top where Bashar al-Assad and his family is to the least Shabiha who committed the uh, atrocities. Okay, uh, Charles, I'm going to go to you with a question from uh, the audience. How do you hold the Assad regime accountable, responsible for its war crimes if it's likely to stay in power uh, in the short term? I mean, as, as Anne said, the regime seems to have uh, won, at least temporarily. So this is this is I guess the ultimate the ultimate question um, I mean it, it, on a simplistic level we're not going to hold the whole Assad regime responsible unless something very dramatic shifts in foreign policy in the United States in Europe and elsewhere particularly in the region uh, 
Parts of the region are now reconsidering re-engagement with the regime because of this conclusion that the war is over or the conclusion that Assad has won, um, both conclusions of which I, I would very strongly disagree with. Um, even temporarily, the war is of, of, uh, of resistance and insurgency in southern Syria. I realize I'm not yet answering your question, but I'm going to get there. In southern Syria, which was uh, ceded to the regime over a year ago, we've seen nearly over 160 attacks just in the last six months, increasing in scale, increasing in sophistication. Um, and so the evidence is already plainly clear that the regime, even though it has expanded its control of a map by roughly 12% in the last two years, uh, it still controls less than two thirds of the country. And even in areas it's retaken, we're now seeing new instability. So the war isn't over. Uh, and so the cause of seeing justice isn't gone, isn't, isn't totally desperate. But there are things that can be done in the interim. Um, sanctions is one significant one, particularly targeting higher levels, uh, higher level perpetrators, uh, making sure they aren't free to commit to international travel, um, freezing uh, any financial interests they may or may not have abroad. And so at the very least, restricting the ability to sanctions, that's not removing medicine from otherwise innocent people. These are sanctioning individuals like the 93 people in this book uh, and making sure that they don't have the rights that are afforded to otherwise normal uh, individuals. Um, and then beyond that, the US and its allies ought to acknowledge that the war isn't over, that we do have interests in Syria, that Syria does matter. As is always said, what happens in Syria does not stay in Syria. We really damn well ought to have learned that over the last nine years. Um, and for that reason, we need to keep our hand on the mantle of a strong policy against the Syrian regime. That's not regime change, um, but it might get us to a point sometime in the future where some form of political settlement happens in which some form of justice and accountability is possible. Uh, and if I can go to you, I mean, uh, how vast is the detention uh, problem uh, in Syria? And, and what's the challenge in, in covering Syria uh, today? You know, having your old stack is happening. It doesn't get enough coverage. So, Well, I think one of the lessons of the piece that we did, which was, again, the, the result of many years of work, um, was that it did come as a surprise to people. I mean, everyone who follows Syria and certainly every Syrian knows about that detention system. And it's not that it wasn't covered amid the sort of flurry of reaction to our piece, where people that had not followed it closely were truly amazed at the scale of, of this uh, torture and uh, um, arbitrary detention system, which is really more resembling to kidnapping than to uh, lawful arrest. Um, people were surprised to know that there are dozens of facilities around Syria. In addition to the so-called normal prisons in each province, there are dozens of headquarters of the four security agencies in Syria, which have uh, torture and jail facilities in their basements usually. Um, some of the these facilities where even the transportation was part of the torture. So there would be dozens, sometimes hundreds of people waiting in courtyards to be transferred from one place to another. And there were just beatings uh, while waiting to be transported, beatings while being transported on planes. Sometimes the transport itself was torture, like being tied to hooks inside a, a meat truck uh, on a bumpy road for hours, uh, hanging by one arm. So it's really a, an industrial scale system. Uh, there are uh, more than 100,000 people who have uh, not been located after having been reported by their families or witnesses as being taken by the security forces. This is not an extrapolation or an estimate. This is a list maintained by Fadil's organization that's based on granular individual reports from people that are verified and kept track of. So um, it's really a, an enormous system. And I think when us over there in the Middle East and, and a sort of normalized idea that that maybe uh, an authoritarian hand is the only way to uh, tamp down terrorism in the region, when in fact we see it's actually the opposite, that the lack of legitimate government and meaningful citizenship, it, it creates the vacuum for terrorism and other militancy and extremism to, to thrive. 
So we have to always keep bringing that context, I think, and really just do the work, and this takes resources and time that media organizations are short of, to find the people who are oftentimes very afraid to speak, who still have relatives in Syria, to try to go to Syria, both in government-held and rebel-held areas, to try to triangulate all these sources of information to con continue trying to get the real picture of what's happening on the ground. Uh, well, if I can turn to you, um, groups in Syria, sometimes with the opposition, um, committing also atrocities and uh, uh, government, the Assad regime itself. Well, thank you very much. Yes, indeed. There um, are uh, uh, different parties that are committing atrocities and uh, a violation to human rights in Syria. As uh, Charles mentioned, there are other uh, parties such as the uh, Islamist radical group, whether uh, be it Daesh, be it uh, Al Qaeda, be it uh, other radical. Our project actually is uh, uh, has three faces. The first face, uh, portfolios. Uh, and, and bios and other parties to, to violate human rights and, and, and commit uh, atrocities. And the third phase, which will uh, be published next year, hopefully, uh, will be focused entirely on perpetrators from the so-called opposition, the, uh, but at the same time committed uh, vi serious viola grave violations to human rights. Uh, Charles, if we can go back to the audience, we have a question on, on Russia. Uh, Monday will be four years since war crimes. Well, this, uh, this I think, is a really important question. The media, I would give a lot of credit to covering war crimes by the Russian government, I should say, I guess, in legal terms, allegedly by, um, but quite clearly. Um, the most clear examples um, have come over the last, more, uh, more clearly over the last 18 to 24 months or so, and where we've seen the targeting, the specific precision targeting of hospitals in the middle of nowhere. As Damascus has, uh, if not more, uh, and they're doing it blatantly in front of all of our eyes. So calling them to account for the crimes that they have conducted. Um, and limiting their ability to continue to influence the diplomatic uh, trajectory of the crisis in Syria, which effectively they're running. According, highlighting this uh, systemized violence, atrocities, help prevent future ones. Uh, and I mean, having covered this, uh, the, the, the Syrian war, the Syrian government for so long, do you get a sense that this is um, a body that's able to uh, recycle? Uh, itself that's you know even when we see uh, uh, Jamil Hassan uh, you know being uh, ousted or sidelined you, you now the head of Air Force intelligence right the head of Air Force intelligence you 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 do see new figures emerge as the war goes on so if you can touch on that okay this is a great question I think you, you know first of all we can't discount the importance of recording and documenting and recognizing what's happening for its own sake, because that means a lot, as, as my colleagues have mentioned, the number of people who have been uh, disappeared, they each have large families, and then we actually, nobody really knows the count of people who have been in the prison system and released, but it must be, again, hundreds of thousands. So it matters to those people to have this recorded and known in the first place. Now, of course, that is cold comfort and, and not justice, but it is not nothing either. So that's the first reason that all these organizations are doing that. The second reason is that uh, the idea is that in the future, at some point, there may be an opportunity for accountability Maybe the dynamics in the Security Council many years from now could change. There could be a referral to the ICC um, or a Syrian process. Again, these are very far off possibilities, but we have seen examples in history where accountability does come, even if it comes very late. Um, what is happening in the interim 
is that Syrian individuals have taken their uh, cases to European national courts that have provisions for what is called universal justice, so uh, they can bring cases on war crimes that have happened elsewhere. And this is happening primarily in Germany, somewhat in France, somewhat in Sweden. There's a number of cases where, that are being heard in courts where they're able to call witnesses um, and build cases that in most cases they don't have a perpetrator in front of them, but there can be convictions in absentia. And there have been three arrests of relatively low level but still significant uh, members of the security forces uh, who will be uh, tried in these cases. So it is a place to start. It's a place to keep uh, the discovery process, so to speak, going, and it's a way to keep it in the news and to also make the uh, you know million Syrians in Europe understand that Europe is taking their human rights seriously, and that's one of the reasons that European governments have an interest in doing so. Charles, do you want to follow up? Yes. Oh. Just quickly, just on the... Um I forget exactly how that question was, was, Legal was worded, framework. but in yeah. terms of things being documented was the thing I wanted to focus on most, was uh, as someone who has followed um, the conflict in Syria on a, on a hawk, like a hawk as you described it, for the last over eight years, social media has sort of revolutionized the way that journalists and analysts are able to follow these conflicts, and social media specifically in the Syrian case where there are vast amounts of information that could potentially be used as part of prosecutions just on YouTube. Um, the one concerning thing that's developed over the last year or so is YouTube, for one reason or another, have started removing uh, a lot of wartime footage from Syria. Uh, I don't think we've seen much of a credible uh, explanation as to why. Um, but an example of just how valuable that documentation can be has just come out in the last few days where an organization I'm sure many of you have heard of, Bellingcat, has been investigating the use of chemical weapons in Syria. And for the first time, after years of investigations, they have managed to identify the specific munition that the Syrian regime has used to drop sarin gas on multiple occasions in Syria. Um, and interestingly, first off, the way they, fi they, fi the, the way they finally discovered that after seeing wreckage of munitions for years and piecing them together to get an idea of what the munitions look like. Um, they found a video from 2013 from a small rebel group in Aleppo who found one of these unexploded munitions. And lo and behold, finally, the puzzle pieces were put together and this munition was, uh, was revealed. To make matters even more interesting and to link Russia into this discussion, the name of this munition was, I think, accidentally revealed by the Russian Ministry of Defense earlier this year in a report in which they tried to take apart the argument that the regime had used chemical weapons. And they actually had a diagram, a detailed diagram of what they called the M4000 bomb in this diagram. And then lo and behold, it is a perfect match for what the Syrian regime had been dropping sarin gas um, on a number of attacks. So all of this information, I think this, you know, to compare it to Rwanda and Bosnia and previous conflicts, those, in my opinion, and I'm not a legal expert, would have been far more challenging because the sheer amount of evidence just simply wasn't there. Yes, we have access, uh, access problems, getting at personal one-to-one -one access on the ground in Syria, but I would imagine that prosecutors see all of this information and this open source intelligence on the internet as an invaluable resource um, in putting together some of these cases, including, as I say, for Russia specifically. Thank you. Uh, well, um, if I can ask you, I don't think uh, Anne answered uh, my question. That's okay. <laughs> On the ability of the regime to recycle. To, uh, to recycle its, its figures, to recycle itself, that even when you see, you know, Asif Shaukat gone, or, uh, you know, uh, the head of the uh, Air Force, Jamil Hassan, uh, sidelined, you're seeing new faces uh, emerge. So uh, do, do you agree with that? And what's the challenge in, 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 your, in the work that you do when these names change? Yeah, there is, well, this is not new, actually. The, the Assad family uh, ha has been doing that for decades. I mean, when Hafez al-Assad was there, he would always make these changes among his uh, entourage and his generals. Uh, but the problem is, what 
difference it makes i mean even even now on 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 the uh, business front we have now new faces instead of the makhlouf family now we have samir foz we have qatraji we have uh, tarazi we have many new business people who emerged and who of, of whom we didn't hear in the past for the for the uh, uh, officials and 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 uh, generals also the the if you want the new generation of people and by the way even the these new people who joined the the front uh, stage are are uh, uh, mentioned in our list like Hussam Luka for example and other people so the idea is not so the, the principle we, 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 we care for is how much the regime is changing his uh, behavior how long he, it's changing its attitude its uh, practices it's not and and we have deep conviction that it will it does not because it cannot because if if, if it does it will lose thing and that's why we believe that there is no chance to accept any change this regime can make whether in his in its behavior or otherwise what we want is a a transition in this country that moves the country from the rule of this corrupt dictator uh, fascist family into a, a democracy in Syria can I just, there's a question just for you on that. It's given your time, the time you spent in regime prisons and, and what you just said, what's the one thing that the US government uh, you'd like to hear from them uh, that would have given you hope? Well, so, <laughs> many things. I actually, I, I, I I was not I. We all were very frustrated and and upset when the uh, U.S. government abolished its program in the south. We had very in, in southern region in Syria. We had v v high expectations of having a model uh, region for for uh, a civil democratic society in in the southern region in Syria. But all of a sudden, overnight, the United States uh, decided to quit. And desert that area and now we hear talk about uh, withdrawing from the Northeast I mean what what I expect from the United States is to to stick to the idea that they cannot make any reconciliation with this regime until a real transition has uh, has occurred we cannot make any reconciliation with this regime until the uh, security council Re Re resolution 2254 has been completely uh, fulfilled on the on on uh, on the ground so it's not a matter of of uh, me be being in uh, uh, having served in prison for four years it's a matter of everybody around me I mean, it's a matter of uh, Abdelaziz Al Khayyar, whose picture is here. He's a, a friend and a colleague and a, a comrade of mine, who disappeared six, five years ago, or six years ago, uh, kidnapped by the regime, and we don't know anything about his whereabouts. It's about uh, Khalil Matouk. It's about Zaki Cordillo. It's about thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of Syrian people who have been abducted, who have been disappeared falsely, and none of them. I can assure you, none of them is a jihadi or is an armed uh, uh, person. Ironically enough, the regime would only target the peaceful, democratic uh, persona and at the same time will find a leeway to, uh, to set free or to avoid uh, targeting the jihadi people. Uh, can I just uh, add one other thing about the, the question I didn't answer before about the regime uh, the gov uh, re regenerating itself? So actually, the example you mentioned of Jamil Hassan is quite important because um, he was the longtime head of the most notorious of the security services, the Air Force Intelligence, um, which ran some of the, does still run some of the most uh, uh, terrible facilities. Um, and he, uh, along with Ali Mamluk, the, the um, uh, top security head, um, has been named in the German cases and, and uh, as a defendant. And there is an Interpol arrest warrant for these guys as well as uh, some others. Uh, so 
again, they're going to stay in Syria. They're not going to just be arrested tomorrow. But it did make a difference uh, that they that, for example, Ali Mamluk had had traveled uh, recently to Italy to to meet with their intelligence services to talk about you know counterterrorism cooperation. You know, uh, so th this kind of stuff can happen. They can't be having shopping trips. You know, it's it's uh, somehow. Um, it's not nothing, um, and I think it, it. And perhaps there was pressure from Russia. I don't know to remove him as a name. Although I doubt that his influence has has dissipated, right? Because in Syria, things don't always go by the hierarchical chart, by the by the organizational chart. But uh, but it does somehow increase the cost of doing business with these particular officials, and it does hamper their options somewhat. Unfortunately, in terms of real reform in the security services, um, what I heard uh, about a year ago from a, an insider uh, who, who knows what's happening with the regime uh, was that there was pressure from Russia to change the security services, but not to make them uh, more respectful of human rights or, or less brutal, but simply to streamline them and make them uh, more, as he put it, uh, efficient, which sounded a bit ominous, actually. Um, so, so right. I don't so, think so. The trials in Germany that are happening can increase the cost or the, the liability for for these regime figures to travel into to travel into and, and and can just uh, as you mentioned about putting uh, pressure on Russia to to name specific officials if if they continue being named then it it uh, I think um, I think. In general, Russia isn't much bothered about these types of uh, attempts to shame. Um, I think it actually uh, resists them and, and, and wants to make the point that, that nobody can, can uh, assert these types of universal rights um, that, because it doesn't want them to be asserted about Russia itself. Um, but again, it just, it's, it's going to complicate things in the long run uh, to, to, by calling out specific people and Russia's cooperation with them. Mm -hmm. uh, Charles, we have a question. What can Europe uh, do? Me uh, mediate this crisis, mitigate Russia and Iran's efforts to prolong the war? What are your thoughts? It's a very tough question because I think whether it's realistic or not, philosophically, Europe collectively still views its ability to influence events as uh, codependent with the US, or I should say dependent on the US taking the same action. I'm not convinced the Europeans are going to do much, um, speaking as a half European myself, I should say European for now, um, European for a few more weeks. Um, uh, I'm not convinced the Europeans are going to do a great deal to significantly change the situation unless they're doing it in concert with the US. Um, I think the, the, the Italy example that Anne mentioned is a, is a good one. Um, the fact that Ali Mamluk was permi was permitted, if not invited, to travel to Italy should have been a shock to the European system, given who he is and his extensive involvement in war crimes. Um, more broadly, there are governments in Europe who are entertaining the idea of re-engaging with the regime. Um, the European Union position is uh, dead set against doing that, but there are individual governments who quite clearly are entertaining a different policy. So I don't particularly have a great deal of hope for, for Europe. I, I do just wanted to quickly point, uh, talk, go back to something about the security services, if you don't mind. Um, I mean, I spent three years working um, very, very closely with hundreds, if not thousands, of Syrians uh, in a process, Syrians of all, of all stripes, of all kinds, of all political and religious and ideological perspectives, talking about how to, how to move towards a meaningful political settlement in Syria. And what, one of the things that every single individual, no matter their background, said, even regime loyalists, was that if there was to be a settlement, it was the security services that needed to be substantially reformed, if not removed entirely from being in existence. And the security services, there's really no, when I talked about the national psyche mm -hmm. and the, the, the capacity of individuals to reconcile and to heal and to be part of a working society, if those four main intelligence directorates continue to exist, um, then the idea of reconciliation and national healing will be a fantasy. And there is a, I hate to keep beating the Russians, but there is a Russian angle here. Um, in July, all four intelligence directorates were completely reshuffled in terms of their leaderships. And all four individuals have very, very clear um, loyalties operationally to the Russian Ministry of Defense, having worked hand in glove with them and distinctly not with Iran or with any of its militias. 
Um, and so I think what Anne was saying in terms of Russia trying to exert influence on the intelligence uh, agencies in Syria is exactly right. But it does also open the Russians up to a good deal of accountability should those agencies continue to commit crimes now that we know that their leaderships are literally working hand in glove with the Russian Ministry of Defense. Um, and again, uh, we know about all of this information. We know about all of these individuals because of open source things on the Internet. These aren't secrets. Um, and so, again, in terms of accountability and documenting these things, I just wanted to emphasize the importance of that again. Uh, well, um, Iran is heavily also involved in the in the war in Syria. Uh, you know, whether you talk about IRGC presence or uh, the Iran-backed Hezbollah. In your research, and in, in, in including, uh, you know, the, the microphone, okay, and including uh, information on on atrocities and uh, torture committed. What's the involvement, if is there any involvement for Iran or Iranian proxies in, in these things, or have they drawn some distance? Well, in our report, we focus only on, uh, uh, directly on, on the regime uh, uh, perpetrators. But we all know that uh, the regime has been, if it wasn't for Iran, it was, if it wasn't for Hezbollah in the first place, and then Russia, the regime would have collapsed years ago. I mean, uh, practically in 2013, 2014, the regime would have collapsed if it wasn't uh, for the intervention of uh, Hezbollah. Hezbollah uh, not 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 only uh, has intervened, has interfered in 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 uh, the battles on the ground, but they have their own prisons, they have their own detainees, they they torture Syrian uh, people. And uh, if, if, import, uh, equally important, they are trying to uh, enforce a, a very, very dangerous thing, which is the demographic uh, changes on the ground in Syria. This is something very, very uh, dangerous and risky. And we see Iran and Hezbollah playing a major role in uh, a demographic, demographic changes in Syria in which entire neighborhoods in cities like my hometown Hamas, for example where it has been people have been evacuated but forced to leave their cities and now they, they, there is uh, an, an attempt to fill uh, in their homes with with uh, other other uh, people from Syria but also from outside Syria this is very dangerous and uh, uh, very little light has been has been shed on it, but Iran and Hezbollah definitely are, in 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 my opinion, they are equally or even more to blame than than the Syrian regime because without them the regime had collapsed definitely. And in in your conversations, you know, maybe I don't know if you've had any recently with civil society activists uh, in Syria. Uh, I mean, how is their morale? How have they have they lost uh, any hope that the situation could change? Well, it's really a very bleak picture in several ways. One is that even people on civilians on the so-called winning side are very depressed. Um, even the source I mentioned who, who's been involved in the war effort uh, told me that he was really thinking about joining his brother by taking a, a raft from, from Turkey to Europe and joining his brother in Sweden. This is the winning side, you know. So it's, it's really, um, th th there's a lot of uh, exhaustion, demoralization. Um, the, the families who, who, who lost a lot of uh, soldiers fighting on the government side as well as on the other side, um, other sides, I should say. But even those people who were the most idealistic, who were the people that you could imagine, uh, you know, meeting in, in a cafe and wherever you live, just the, the young intellectuals, the professors, the doctors, um, the, the humanitarians, the people who volunteer for their local uh, Red Crescent chapter, you know, these people um, gave, took risks that they never really expected to take to try to have some marginal improvement in their lives. And uh, the whole thing went farther and became more dangerous than they thought, but they were already committed. They kept going. 
they lost everything. Most of them are now refugees. And um, when I talk to them, a lot of them now in Europe, uh, what I hear from them is both very sad and also there is this grain of hope in it, which is they describe going through something that they all call the phase, which is <laughs> that after all that adrenaline and, and ups and downs and survival, guilt, they come to a place of safety and then they just collapse for a year or two. Some of them are struggling with addiction or depression or, or all kinds of issues. Um, and bit by bit, they come out of the phase and they say, okay, the, the amazing thing is that, as you know, if uh, people in the room are, are Syrian or follow Syria, uh, most of these people are still only 28 years old, <laughs> you know, um, and after all this, and they say, okay, I have a life ahead of me. I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones who survived. So uh, either I'm going to pause and work on myself and develop my professional skills. I'm going to learn political science. I'm going to learn medicine, whatever it is, so that I can help Syrians in the future. Um, or they say, I will um, try to help Syrians in the way that I can where I am. So I will help Syrians in the diaspora. So it's, it's, it's quite amazing the resilience, including from people who have been through incredible torture, uh, to, to search for a way to help others and to um, continue to sort of follow their principles. And uh, actually, okay, keep the mic because uh, we have a member of the audience who's trying to draft you back to to uh, to covering uh, Syria. So uh, they ask, how can we uh, convince you to continue your reporting of Syrian war crimes? We need journalists who care. Any chance? <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, well, um, I, maybe my editors are listening. I don't know. Um, uh, I absolutely, I, I'm never going to stop uh, following the Syrian case, um, and I'm committed to uh, seeing what happens in the long run. Um, at the same time, um, I like, you know, in a, in, a, in a much paler version of what those uh, Syrians have been through, uh, I needed to um, come home and, and tend to my parents and, and my kids and, uh, it's uh, there's a practical difficulty of continuing to focus 100% of the time on Syria when I have moved back to New York. Uh, but I am still working on these things in addition to my, my main beat, which is on climate and the environment. And um, I think the, the good thing is that uh, there is a huge cadre of, um, of Syrian journalists, uh, Arab American and, and other Arab hyphenated or Arab journalists um, who have really picked up the baton and of course international journalists as well, a younger generation that are just as committed and, and, and I stay committed as well. And we will see a book. Uh, on, on Inshallah. <laughs> She's working on a book on Syria. Uh, Charles, if I can turn to you on, uh, you know, you follow uh, jihadist movements in Syria. If we want to talk about accountability uh, in, in that sense, would it be the same mechanism given, you know, these are non-state actors and in, 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 uh, in bringing them to, uh, to justice? Uh, it's a good question. It's one that's probably better asked to a legal expert. I find it hard to imagine there would be any difference because we're still talking about individuals and individual crimes perpetrated by individuals. Um, just as much as there is evidence of the regime committing crimes and war crimes, there are uh, there is evidence of, uh, of, of jihadists and other groups. Um, Free Syrian army groups have been accused of committing crimes too. Uh, it do, it's not necessarily an ideological thing. Um, I think there have, I'm not so familiar with the cases, but I think there have been a few individuals in Europe who have been arrested as refugees and are being prosecuted for being and convicted um, for being part of the opposition and or uh, jihadist group. So um, that process is, is already underway. As I say, if the, if the information is there, if people are identified, and if they leave Syrian soil, um, there is uh, the ability there to see accountability. And then to talk specifically within the counterterrorism lens, there are also you know, foreign fighters who have gone off and joined uh, al-Nusra, uh, Daesh, and other groups who have attempted to come back and have been arrested uh, on arrival, whether in the United States, in Europe, in Australia. I've been involved uh, in a number of, uh, in helping out in a number of those trials. Um, and that's a process that continues. 
Um, and those people aren't necessarily being convicted of war crimes, but just simply traveling to a foreign land to join a terrorist organization and being involved in terrorist activities of any kind. So there is, in that, in that sort of simplistic sense, accountability in one way or another um, already being met out. As I say, that's, that's no different here in Europe and, and, and more broadly. Uh, and, and I have a question for each of the speakers uh, here. What is one thing people in this room can do to contribute to efforts to hold the uh, regime in Syria uh, to account? One, only one? <laughs> Use your uh, social media platforms in order to uh, flag the, the Syrian uh, tragedy and to uh, make people not, not forget what's going on in Syria. But I have another point, if you allow me. S talk to your uh, Congress people and senators. It's very important that we push our representatives in order to influence the, the US administration to play uh, a, a more uh, aggressive role in, in, in Syria and to prevent the withdrawal symptom, if you want, from uh this current administration it, it's very important that the, the united states be remain a leader of uh the the process of change in syria uh, i think uh, wael has the right to name many more um but, but I, um you know from from the point of view I can most speak about, uh, support journalism, pay for uh, subscriptions to news organizations, uh, because just because things are free on the web doesn't mean that they are free to produce. Um, uh, support uh, civ Syrian civil society, even if you are, there are many accountability organizations, but there is also, uh, if you support any organization, healthcare, uh, education, et cetera, you are supporting the existence of thinking Syrians, of a, of a Syrian civil society that's aspiring to something better. Um, and finally, I think that, that as a world, we need to think on, on the meta level about uh, how we think about uh, the Middle East and how we how we think about conflict in general, and maybe to rethink uh, the lens uh, since 9/11 of seeing everything in the world as uh, as a fight against terrorism. That that's the only thing that matters above all else. You know, again, without downplaying the effects of of a group like ISIS, but but looking at uh, the need for legitimate governance around the world, the idea that the Middle East, Arabs, Muslims are no different than people around the world in terms of uh, their needs, their rights, their aspirations, and uh, sort of uh, pigeonholing an entire region uh, as a place where anything is allowed to be done to those people in the name of fighting terrorism is really uh, the root of the mistake. I think just to pick up on that point by Anne, as a, as a Brit and an American, I've covered the Syrian crisis from the UK, from the US, and in the region. Um, and all three of those places have looked at Syria in a, from a very different lens. Um, and I've been most shocked in the US at the extent to which, exactly as Anne is describing it, um, there is more and more of a sense over time, and increasingly now, a sense of which, and you hear this from government officials, from Democrats speaking in debates, what happens there just doesn't affect us anymore. We don't need to care. Yeah. Um, and and, and I, I'm, my mind is just boggled when I hear that because when I listed out at the beginning of my comments why Syria matters, every single one of those issues significantly affected the United States of America. I think it's impacted our domestic politics. Um, it's definitely impacted our security at home and abroad. It's affected the way that our allies in the region treat us. Our unwillingness to engage more seriously in Syria has seen us degrade our credibility with our allies. Um, and as I said, the war is not ending anytime soon. It's changing, but it's certainly not ending. Um, and the do, you see, um, do you see ISIS I'll just, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, making a uh, resurgence? Well, that's one of the things. I mean, I think I think it's virtually guaranteed. 
Um, I wrote, I, I'm not plugging it, but I, but I don't have the time to read that article out loud right now, but I wrote an article in Foreign Policy a couple months ago called um, something along the lines of Assad hasn't won anything. Um, and it doesn't just tell you that Assad hasn't won anything, it tells you that Syria is going to be, um, for want of a better word, a launching pad for it, incredible instability, not just in Syria, but that will almost certainly affect the region, if not the rest of the world, um, for years to come. Um, and this brings me to the specific answer of what, you, what one can do as an American is keep the discussion going, uh, come to events like this to broaden your horizons, to keep your horizons broad, um, realize that Syria is still going on and why it matters to the US. Um, and the last thing I'll say to place it into the context of, again, the Syria study group report coming out this week um, is a discussion I was at earlier this morning, in fact, uh, three of us were here, were there early this morning, is that it's a, becoming an established fact within the Republican Party that Syria doesn't matter and we should be leaving. And it is an established fact in the Democratic Party. In fact, um, it doesn't appear like any single Democrat presidential candidate supports the idea of remaining engaged in Syria. Militarily, diplomatically, counter ISIS, Iran, any of those issues. Um, that's dangerous because the war isn't stopping, because the, the war in Syria won't stop affecting the rest of the world. And the moment we leave, we lose all control and we won't be able to go back. It, diplomatically, militarily, financially, economically, what, what have you. Um, that decision has hugely momentous consequences. And the reason why policymakers are justifying it is because the general public don't want to be in Syria. That's their justification. So if the general public disagrees and is informed enough to know that there is a reason for us to be involved in Syria, diplomatically, militarily, economically, what have you, they need to hear that from their constituents. Because at the moment, they're using you as an excuse to leave with very dangerous consequences. Uh, we have, actually, we're out of time. But can I sneak one last question to uh, the mic? Somebody, yeah. uh, last question to, uh, to Wael. It's, it's, they're asking if the ICJ uh, can take up the, why hasn't they taken up the Syrian war crimes investigation like they did in the Balkans? And a personal question to you. Uh, do you see yourself returning uh, to Syria? Well, first of all, about the uh, ICJ, the, there is, the answer is very easy, one word, it's Russia. Because you cannot, uh, the I ICJ doesn't have the authority to take up cases unless referred to by the Security Council. And every time this issue comes, uh, Russia and China, of course, but basically Russia uh, rejects that. We uh, we have uh, other mechanism, but it, it will it will take longer longer process. We 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 should uh, bet on triple uh, IM for example the the mechanism which the General Assembly uh, established for for Syria. In the long run, that might uh, lead to something. But I C J cannot take up cases unless referred to. And as long as the Russians have their veto power, we, we will not see uh, ICJ taking up the case. Uh, w will I return to Syria? I think personally, of course, uh, like my wife and I will definitely go back to Syria. Uh, we will uh, cherish the United States and put it in our hearts. But uh, uh, going back to Syria is a dream and is a possibility. Uh, the issue actually is with the, with the new generation. Like I have a 20 year old daughter who uh, left Syria when she was 12 years old, and now she is studying here. And thousands and thousands of her age and younger in Europe and Turkey and the United States and Canada. And I don't see these people uh, return to Syria, unfortunately, which we will leave, which will leave Syria a vacant country of. Um, expertise and talent and uh, and energy. Well, uh, thank you all. We had uh, more questions. Some are very uh, like this one. I would have liked to ask it to to, to Charles, but we're out of time. Uh, thank you and thanks, Charles. Uh, thanks, well. Please join me in giving them a round of applause.